Russian summon of the world's top investors to Bosnia and Balkans region, especially from Asia. So maybe you can tell us more about your experience in inve invest investments because that's what uh, the, the topic we have right now. Sure, thank you Tatiana and thank you um, um, you as a president of the Student Union of Regions and Regions for co-hosting this uh, Q&A coffee with me. Um, I've been a, a, a big, big fan of your uh, work and your university and uh, I, uh, I'm glad we are uh, talking today. Um, my experience, you know, I, I did masters in mathematics many, many years ago and I pretty much moved into an M&A a world uh, not in the traditional um, structures by going and working for an investment bank or hedge fund but off the back of my own initiatives and my own sort of uh, direction which I felt uh, was more suitable to somebody like me uh, I uh, sort of didn't uh, follow the, the sort of trajectory of most of my friends uh, who went straight in the city uh, for the reason that um, when I first came to, to the UK in early 90s, uh, there was a raging war in uh, Bosnia and former Yugoslavia at the time. So as one of the SARS stipendees, I just felt uh, even the vision of somebody who uh, offered me a scholarship uh, at the time uh, when uh, it was uh, difficult to obtain one, uh, my whole character uh, sort of was being built before my eyes without me actually knowing and understanding uh, why it was happening. So uh, the investment uh, world and the recessions of the early 90s, the recessions of uh, noughties, the recession of 2008, and now COVID-2020 as we're entering a new recession, is something that um, has always kind of been around me uh, in a different uh, structures and different setups. You know, the recessions that hit uh, Yugoslavia at the time uh, during the war was something that's very, very difficult to imagine and it's not your typical recession that we've seen around the world, but it has a very, very similar sort of uh, components and characteristics to what we're going through now. In uh, my own life uh, as a co-investor, investor, entrepreneur, uh, I've always uh, approached it uh, with the view that there are opportunities uh, when there are difficult times. And uh, in every difficult situation, uh, there are also winners and losers. And I take the view that uh, what's happening right now, uh, however difficult it might be, uh, is also going to pose lots of opportunities. And uh, I've always followed the um, sort of uh, road that uh, was uh, created by the group of people I've worked with. Uh, we did take a look at the distressed assets around the world, uh, between Asia, uh, between the, the, the sort of uh, uh, Europe and, uh, and London in particular. And uh, because of that, uh, we have managed to always uh, come out of uh, different opportunities uh, with, uh, with the view that uh, uh, all despite all the challenges and despite all the risks, uh, we took, in some instances, uh, we managed to balance out the portfolio, we managed to actually come out uh, uh, in, in the positive. Okay, interesting. So what is your uh, most famous or your most big deal in the investment world? I mean, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to talk about the most famous and most uh, and the biggest in that sense, because I tend to work uh, with big players. Uh, big investment banks, big hedge funds, uh, big institutional investors from around the world. And I often uh, am in the, call it the, the background from the deal origination all the way to the deal closure, uh, wearing different hats and managing uh, investors, uh, managing the investment opportunities, managing the legal structure around it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we've had deals by purchasing banks, by purchasing companies, uh, restructuring them, relisting them at uh, various stock markets around the world, uh, you know, buying the assets that were in a very difficult uh, uh, sort of uh, situations, buying them out of the bankruptcy uh, estates because uh, of the fact that, that uh, uh, they, they had uh, issues, but also they had all the legalities around it. So I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, pick out one deal over the next. Uh, I would more pick out the fact that uh, uh, we always approached it with a great deal of uh, due diligence. Every deal is unique. Uh, whether you are delisting the company from the stock market, 
whether you are buying a company out of the bankruptcy estate uh, or whether you are investing and picking out uh, the companies with high growth potentials, uh, you have to approach it as a unique proposition every single time. Of course, the business world and investment world have got their systems and processes and the rules and various rules of thumb. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, business and investment is all about people. I think the balance sheet and the bottom line is one thing, but when it comes down to talent spotting, which is something that the family offices have really gone into over the past 10 to 20 years, uh, whether you talent spot a hedge fund manager, whether you talent spot an investment banker, whether you talent spot an entrepreneur whose company is worth 10 million, but has a, has a potential to be the next unicorn, it is all about uh, doing a great deal of due diligence and the track record and checking the track record of these people who basically own uh, companies and who have the visions. The key thing for everything we do is to align our own ambition, our own purpose, our own vision with those of the people behind these companies and these investment opportunities. Great, thank you very much. So let's move to the main topic. Um, what is your... Because now we just have like these three weeks of a new world. And uh, can you tell us your, your thoughts? What do you think? How do you see it? How, because like we, have, we, we can face changes every day, every hour, something close, something changes. So what is your vision for this moment? But let's talk about the current... I mean, Tatiana, I mean, Tatiana you and I spoke the other day about uh, uh, what we need right now, apart from the, the, the right leadership apart from the, the right direction, uh, the skill set that we need as, as individuals, as corporations. And I mentioned to you a few years ago, I met a Professor Grayling, uh, who's one of the biggest philosophers of this country and one of the biggest philosophers in the world. And uh, when I asked him many years ago, uh, Professor, what are the skills we ought to teach our children uh, who will be in the labor market in 10, 15, 20, 30 years? He said, so made the two key skills that uh, we ought to teach our children but also our adults is adaptability and thinking outside of the box and now think of the current situation i've just been on the call with my chinese uh, partners and friends this uh, this morning uh, sort of telling them uh, that they can tune in and they said to so may very kind of you to invite us but uh, in china the restaurants have just opened after three months of the self-isolation oh. and the quarantine and it's very difficult to convince any of our friends and partners to actually tune into your talk because we are enjoying food and wine in China. Now, uh, that's great that uh, they're ahead of the curve. However, uh, I've got to uh, be honest uh, with, with the listeners today, but the wider audience as well. Uh, I, I think um, the current situation is going to co go on longer than um, we all initially thought. Uh, I must admit, when this first came up, uh, I was quite so cynical about it, and I thought, come on, it's just another flu. Uh, so I was somewhat flippant, despite all my experience, that, uh, you know, we're going to get out of this. We're, we're strong. We, we sort of uh, have a great character in the, in, in the times of crisis, and we'll be able to deal with it. However, the more I've read into it, the more uh, I've talked to various people, from astrologers, uh, to uh, mental uh, health campaigners and doctors, uh, to investors, the more I realize that we have to embrace ourselves for a long haul flight here. I personally think the situation at its current format, it's gonna take three to six months rather than three to six weeks. I think we're going to have restrictions uh, imposed on us by governments from around the world for around 12 months. I think it's very important that we accept the fact that we have to adapt to the current a situation and use all we can uh, in terms of uh, reaching out to the right people, discussing it with the right people, and, uh, and really quickly switching our lives and our businesses to the fact that uh, we will not be able to do proper face-to-face. -face. Uh, life goes on as normal because the banking sector and the financial sector and the support mechanisms around us must carry on. We can't leave people in difficult situations and leave them to their own devices. Uh, I think I mentioned, uh, Tatiana, to you as well, my early experience of uh, coming from uh, the, the war-torn country where 
our capital was under siege for 1425 days. Uh, and then I remember my own parents told me the story that I was going to go to London for three months. I was going to perfect my English stay with my um, auntie and uncle and my cousins as I used to come here very regularly before the war. And then within three months, I'm going to come back and continue with my studies. Obviously, the three months turn into three decades. And what was the key thing there? Um, I, uh, unlike many people who happened to be in Bosnia at the time, uh, was lucky and privileged that I could, although very, uh, very sort of uh, traumatically watch uh, the, uh, what was unfolding there uh, on the TV screen in London. But uh, I was in direct contact with people on the ground there who technically had to self-isolate for three and a half years. Now, uh, during the course of the war in uh, former Yugoslavia, but in Bosnia in particular, these people had the hope. These people had the indications that the war was going to last one, two, three years rather than four. These people also had to adapt to the situation of getting up, uh, uh, exercising, going out, despite the fact that uh, often going out and, and waiting in the queues to get bread or the, the, the basic essentials ended up in the massacres, uh, in the marketplaces, uh, on the streets of Sarajevo. They had to accept the fact that when they go out, there are snipers, and the snipers shot hundreds of people dead uh, in Sarajevo, including children. Uh, there were mortar attacks. Early on, there were airplanes uh, uh, landing bombs. And uh, later on, the front lines uh, uh, around them were literally hundreds of yards away. They could see them from the windows of their houses or their flats because that's how close they were. So now taking the parallel between us in the current situation where I hear lots of people complaining about the queues in front of the supermarkets, lots of people complaining about the fact that they can't go and meet and see the loved ones. Uh, and uh, we just have to embrace what's happening right now as much as we can. And I think we're gonna to touch on the mental health uh, issues a bit later on. And we really have to uh, direct our energy and our sort of uh, abilities to raise and rise above any challenges and any difficulties in the best possible way. I think we have to share it uh, with the wider community. I think we have to try and spread positivity and, uh, and, and encouragement uh, because with the media, the way it's played uh, for decades now with the scaremongery, it's not easy. I mean, I, to be frank, I don't watch the news. I don't watch the new announcements because I know, I know I'm going to learn about them one way or another. Uh, they're going to be imposed on me. And I really try to use uh, 20 hours a day or 18 hours a day to be as constructive with my family, with my friends, with my business partners, with my uh, sort of extended networks and see what we can learn from each other. I think this is uh, both the curse and the blessing in disguise in terms of us as the human race coming back to the basics, realizing that uh, you know, things like this could happen over and over again. And I'm not gonna point a, a, a finger of blame at anyone because I don't believe in the blame culture. And uh, we just have to see what it is we can do. What is the new uh, status that we have now assumed? What's the new value that we can create What's the new knowledge that we can create and how we can transfer that to the wider audience and take all a little bit of the leadership role uh, rather than just uh, sit back and do nothing and wait for this to, to end because frankly speaking, it's not gonna end anytime soon. And where, even when it ends, it's never gonna be the same again. And we will suffer, all of us, a traumatic experience of, uh, mm -hmm of the fact that uh, we were technically imprisoned in our own houses for months on end. And now we might actually attend the, the outside world with the paranoia that there might be lots of passive COVID uh, uh, carriers who might infect us one way or another. So the, the, the mental strength and the powerful mind is gonna come in uh, much, much uh, more, become much, much more important than ever before. Thank you. I have, I have a question related um, 
there are actually these changes in flexibility. So on your opinion, which businesses, which kind of like areas will die forever after this? For example, some successful and uh, good investments opportunities, which like, which were um, uh, on the top one month ago and which will never recover after the situation. What, what is your opinion? I mean, it's, it's a very good question, Tatiana. I, I, I don't like to say uh, or predict that any industry will die out forever. I think many, many industries, in particular the hospitality, in particular the, the sort of any, anything to do with a, a direct um, contact uh, in the foreseeable future, will be massively, massively affected. And uh, some of them, businesses, not the industries, will never recover. Uh, on the flip side, uh, anything to do with the online, anything to do with the artificial intelligence and technology, anything to do with almost serving of the community and the society at large will probably uh, massively uh, uh, benefit from the current situation. I was tuning to one of the talks last night uh, about the guys who do the blue collar uh, recruitment. And because right now the blue collar uh, labor force is in, in the huge demand, they're actually experiencing a huge, huge peak uh, in the demand of their services. Uh, and they're actually fast forwarding and fast tracking uh, the investment uh, around uh, to actually go further uh, when it comes down to the opportunities and enter the US market. Because I believe the US market will be hardest hit. Uh, I think they are, uh, they, they took. Uh, the whole situation um, initially, again, very flippantly, but it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, country uh, with so many states to control because every state is the law to itself. And it's not easy even for President Trump uh, to be able to manage uh, how, how the whole uh, pandemic is going to affect the United States. So I think um, things alongside the lines of the sustainable development goals that the United Nations have really uh, mandated for many global businesses around the world. I like this 17th ones because there's 17, which is the partnership for the goals behind the 16 prior ones. I think we're going to see um, a more uh, uniting, uh, uniting of forces and uniting of visions and co-sharing so I think that the kind of, uh, we talked about sharing economy for quite a few years now as the new big thing to invest in. I think that's going to definitely benefit. So um, I hope I answer your question. I, I wouldn't like to point uh, at any of the businesses or any of the industries that will totally fail right now. I think it's, 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 it's very difficult for me to say that. But you mentioned cost sharing, but uh, according to the current situation, when you kind of like get the virus from some uh, things, you know, for example, if we're talking about, I don't know, cars or anything kind of uh, um, where we have a co common ownership, that's the risk to get some, you know. Um, I, I didn't mean it co-sharing in the physical way. I meant in a co-sharing in a, in a way, kind of virtual way, because that's, that's going to be our reality for the next, for the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, I think the, uh, I'm reading more about the electrical vehicles and the ecological projects really gaining the momentum. Uh, I've been involved with Formula E uh, over the past two years, promoting it in the Balkans to try to give the whole region a, a, a new image uh, of the region that's out of technology and sustainability. Uh, I'm talking to lots of people in, in the space of uh, uh, actually technology, ecology, even esports, because uh, esports, uh, lots of people think. Uh, are all about gaming, uh, which uh, to a large extent uh, there are, but I recently met somebody who runs the British uh, Esports Association, uh, who's recently worked very closely with the uh, Royal uh, uh, Force um, and, and the British military here in uh, creating the gaming rooms for some of the uh, soldiers that have come from very uh, difficult uh, front lines in Afghanistan and, and the Middle East, uh, in particular, and uh, who felt so isolated, so anxious, and so depressed after uh, the real kind of uh, uh, wartime sort of uh, positions and situations. So we're seeing, uh, for example, the Formula E races have all been uh, cancelled. 
uh, all the sporting events have been cancelled, as we know, including the Olympics in Tokyo. But people are really fast moving in going online and engaging with the crowds around the world. I think we're going to see that uh, united front as a result of uh, uh, almost a fast transformation and overnight transformation of many businesses and many individuals' lives uh, in that direction. And I think that's a positive. I think uh, we will appreciate the importance of technology. I think after this, uh, after this uh, call it a war against COVID-19, we will also appreciate more uh, the, the kind of human touch and face-to-face -face interactions, uh, which were just normal to us. I mean, I often talk about London being a very, very um, tough and vicious environment uh, because you're literally framed in a matter of seconds by people you meet at various networking events as somebody who can offer something or somebody who can't offer something. And you are sort of uh, bracketed and boxed into the cold, warm, or hot lead because obviously everyone's after business, everyone wants to gain uh, a new opportunity and open a new network. But in actual fact, uh, people have forgotten uh, and lost themselves uh, that uh, in actual fact, the real business is done through the common purpose. So if we have the common purpose to change the world, to improve our bottom line, to create something together and make it successful, profitable, and somewhat philanthropic, uh, we have to approach it in a very different way. I, I don't take uh, business cards to any networking events. I don't uh, often attend many, but when I do, because I just don't want to give cards away for the sake of it. But I'm often surrounded by people who literally in the last five minutes of the networking event, realize that they are about to lose a business opportunity that is never for real. And they start going around the room in the last five minutes, panicking and giving their cards away. And I often say to them, sorry, we haven't even spoken for a minute. I really don't want your card because I don't even know who you are and what you do. And I really don't want you to waste paper on me because we're very unlikely to connect. So I genuinely think there's going to be a big mind shift uh, when it comes down to uh, the, the current crisis we're facing. I think if we play this right, it's going to be hugely beneficial to us as a human race. Of course, there are going to be many, many people who will be affected uh, with the loss of jobs, with the loss of opportunities, with so many investments on pause and on hold right now because everybody's just waiting to see how the markets will bounce back and the markets always bounce back. Uh, there will not be the crash of the financial market. There will not be the end of the world. None of that is actually true. Whatever the media is trying to feed us and scare us, uh, we must take uh, the situation in our own hands and do our bit. We must follow the guidance uh, of the governments in terms of the social distancing and everything else. I'm a big uh, uh, promoter uh, of that. But uh, we genuinely will... Um, benefit as a human race as a society if we play this right but we must embrace uh, ourselves for a long haul flight which will go uh, years beyond the next six to 12 months i mean we've seen china bouncing back in the record time but i also know that uh, china uh, is facing a huge huge challenge to stop the comeback of covid19 and everyone who knows enough about the way these viruses operate actually is pretty confident, uh, if, if not 100% sure, that the COVID-19 will come back to China uh, in early autumn. And they might have to go through it again, just like we will in, in the Western world. Yeah, currently, currently that, that's what happens now because uh, all European people and people from America, they are knowing that uh, China is kind of safe right now. They're coming back and bring the virus again. So that's because if you don't watch news that much, I watch it once, one time per day. So I can tell it for you. So uh, actually, I, I had a question about China because you have Chinese partners and I, want, I wanted to know your opinion, you know, because when this uh, COVID situation happened, there was a uh, one kind of uh, version of the a situation that a Chinese kind of Chinese people uh, they kind of created this virus or spread those virus uh, to 
create the collapse. So um, owners of uh, the main shares of Chinese companies, they started to sell those, those shares and very cheap. Chinese people bought it for a good price. It kind of like brought back the, the ownership of all plants and the businesses they have inside China. Is it true? What do you think? <laughs> well, uh, Tatiana, conspiracy theories uh, uh, really boom in the times of crisis. I mean, uh, I, 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 we had them in the war in Bosnia in terms of the conspiracy of the certain uh, leadership uh, against certain members of the army and the generals. And uh, of course, uh, there's been conspiracy around this uh, from the day one and maybe even before it even started. I don't believe, uh, having spent the last 20 years uh, with the Chinese uh, friends, family members, investors, uh, working very closely with one of the biggest calligraphy masters uh, of, of China, uh, who has uh, got a, a global vision of promoting peace and prosperity for all, not the Chinese. Uh, I don't uh, believe uh, the Chinese are behind this. Uh, I don't believe that the Chinese have created it to rule the world. However, I can't blame the Chinese because they are an incredibly powerful and cash liquid position not to commercially benefit from the investment opportunities that are uh, inevitably happening because of the fact that uh, the Western world, America uh, and Europe in particular, aren't and weren't prepared for something like this. I don't think uh, many people believe they could be this bad. And we've seen it with the uh, president of Serbia and president of America in the first week, uh, just a month ago, literally joking about this being a flu and being something they can deal with and being something like uh, that would just disappear. And uh, within days they change the rhetoric and they realize having consulted the medical experts that this is not a joke and this is going to affect the economy. This is going to send us into the recession uh, overnight and we've not even properly recovered from 2008 and uh, recession and the Lehman so Brothers collapse. Uh, so um, I think if the Americans, the Brits, uh, the, the, the Arabs were in a position to benefit commercially from the investment opportunities, they would do the same thing. I think the Chinese, because of the way in which China is ruled, it's still a, a sort of a, a form of um, communist leadership where the number one tells the rest of the country how they should behave and they follow it. I think we saw that uh, where the press conference Putin gave, uh, which lasted 30 seconds. Uh, he came on air. He said, uh, basically, as of today, you either go indoors for 14 days or you face five years behind bars. End of conference. So uh, why the leadership like that really works uh, is because people listen and people in these parts of the world have been used to challenging testing times, difficulties, hardship, a lot more than we have been in the Western world where what we thought was just uh, the way of life uh, for lots of people was huge privilege and, uh, and something that they couldn't even touch. So this just shows you when you have got the experience of hardship, when the global hardship happens like it's happening uh, to all of us now, no matter whether you're rich or poor, we technically being in our house prison, uh, we have to now find the coping mechanisms to be able to do that. As, in I, as I mentioned early on in our, in our sort of uh, conversation, there are going to be many winners and many losers when it comes down to uh, investment opportunities, when it comes down to, uh, to the businesses that will go bust, and it comes down to the businesses that will go through the roof. So the Chinese are only doing uh, what they're supposed to be doing in the market economy, in the global village, and uh, in the investment world. Thank you. So the next question is actually um, about the investment opportunities. Uh, so now we have this uncertain situation, and of course, shares like going mad. And uh, some people, for example, I know they're buying, uh, searching for lands in Italy, because Italy right now is one of the worst country in case of the COVID-19. And of course, the price will, it was going down. So they're kind of buying those lands, you know, assuming that it will go up again and will become normal uh, in soon. So 
in this global situation, for example, when U.S. is the worst in, in case of the cases, in the number of cases, you know, what is the opportunity where, like, for example, so some people think that they have to keep cash. For example, a lot of big businessmen, they literally said, like, guys, don't, like, don't do nothing, just keep cash for now. Uh, some people say, like, okay, try to invest in your business and push it, even if it, look, like, if it seems like you should, shouldn't do it. So what is your um, advice? Like, well, what do you think in, in, in this uncertain situation, especially first few months where people literally don't understand what happened? There is an opportunity, you're right. So what is the opportunity? Where to go? How, what is the, give, give us some tricks. Sure, I mean, Tatiana, the, the, there's no, uh, there's no uh, tricks as such. Uh, I, I, I read a lot about what the, the, the big guys uh, talk about the guys that are uh, perhaps uh, a, a, a couple of decades ahead of me and also uh, a, a sort of uh, with a huge uh, repertoire of the successful uh, investment deals they've done from Warren Buffett to George Soros to uh, Bill Gates uh, to uh, Michael Bloomberg to the people that you know whether you like them or hate them uh, they, they are uh, really they have mastered the um, sort of uh, investment uh, strategy and uh, and they've really done it in often in the most difficult uh, times and the times of crisis and recessions so um, Italy um, I don't know enough about whether that would be something that I would in, uh, entertain myself I think the key thing when you're looking at the investment opportunities and I spoke to one of the hedge funds uh, in London that I've just launched uh, in this uh, in this times of crisis, who are looking at uh, equities long and short, mostly European, uh, the fund managers and the owners there are telling me that uh, it's never been a better opportunity for them to pick uh, the the stock that, in their opinion, is going to perform. However, it's going to change their own business model, and it's going to really suit those who are looking at the long-term returns rather than short and medium-term returns. I think with short and medium-term uh, uh, returns, the stock market uh, is going to uh, have the clear winners and clear losers. And I think my advice to anyone who's looking from real estate to stock markets, to hedge funds, to the VCs, or any other investment opportunities is to do uh, an extra deal of due diligence. I think now the question is going to be of... Uh, doing uh, and, and narrowing your spectrum of investment opportunities from maybe what would have been 5% of the deals and the deal flow they would look at down to maybe 2%. Uh, really uh, have the people around you who know about tactical investment and investment in terms of crisis, the people that have sailed through the oceans uh, in, the, in the months of January rather than the month of June, July, in the ocean sort of times when the weather isn't really on your side. And uh, these are going to be uh, the important decisions that any investor uh, will have to make. I don't genuinely believe in keeping cash if you have the, 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 the potential to invest. is the right thing to do in boom or bust. In actual fact, cash or any currency is king in the times of crisis, even a lot more than in the, crisis, in the times of boom because uh, you have a lot less competition just because the human uh, sort of psychology dictates that uh, we have to now sit back and wait and see what's going to happen. So uh, technology uh, is uh, going to uh, really, uh, the right uh, technology uh, platforms are going to boom in this. I think one's got to look at them. Uh, the real estate market will have its opportunities as well. Uh, it had it before the recession, it will have it during the recession. So one's got to, again, be very, very uh, knowledgeable about where, where they sit. I don't know how Italy is going to take the entire thing. And I, my problem with Italy is liquidity of the market. So you might be able to acquire something that is basically very low uh, in price right now. But will you be able to exit uh, the, that investment opportunity is something I would, uh, I would question uh, when advising people to go into the Italian market. I think we have to surround ourselves with the people who know what they're talking about, the people who have weathered the storm many times over. I think the, the kind of the club, investment club uh, structures that are going to be formed during this crisis uh, are going to basically unite people behind a common purpose 
and the, and the kind of uh, the, the sense of uh, being able to learn through the process because you know making a good investment uh, is one uh, one sort of uh, characteristic of people who invest all the time but what does that investment give you back in return in addition to cash i think we're going to see a lot more strategic investors coming forward i think we're going to see a lot more people from asia uh, coming forward and uh, really uh, joining forces the way the Chinese doctors and the Chinese companies have uh, offered uh, to, to, to sort of help uh, hospitals around the world, I genuinely think we're going to uh, be a lot more united uh, than uh, before the actual crisis. And I think if we play our cards right, uh, all of us uh, within our own uh, constraints could come out of this as winners, as leaders, as those who can really inspire the next generation and learn from all the mistakes we will make also in this uh, process. Um, thank you. Uh, let me see, I think. Okay, yeah, there is a question like, if you're still accepting new people into the Mayfair Investment Club and who do you accept? Uh, well, um, it's it's a it's a new thing that uh, has emerged um, very much as a result of my years of mentoring um, and developing uh, business opportunities for other entrepreneurs and investors. And uh, a few months ago, after a year of development, uh, we actually at Regents uh, University launched the Mayfair Investment Club, uh, which main purpose is really to. Uh, pick out the talent that wants to go into the world of investment as opposed to entrepreneurship, who really wants to learn the ropes of the investment uh, uh, strategies and the tactical investment, and who really want to build themselves up as the leaders of tomorrow. So uh, it's a rather non-typical way how we deal with the people interested in it. Of course, uh, it's designed to be by invitation only club. It's designed to pick out the caliber of people that have the right mindset uh, and they really want to uh, embark on a journey of uh, future investors, go behind the scenes and meet some of the masterminds and uh, 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 people who have uh, put together very successful investment portfolios, have exited a number of different companies successfully and have really returned investment for themselves and the investors. So uh, it, as it's a new thing, yes, we do. Um, have the doors semi-open, I would say. Uh, we aim to host a, a series of seminars on that subject and why we believe the purpose of the Mayfair Investment Club and the foundation that we want to build uh, sort of adjacent to that. And uh, I'll be talking this weekend to somebody uh, who might want to get involved to help us build the foundation uh, because we want to fast track the foundation launch in addition to the actual club. Uh, so we keep our eyes and ears open uh, we want to attract the right people from around the world we want to use the the, the covid 19 as something that will really fast track our vision and mission for the creation of the new and better future uh, alongside the lines of the uh, sustainable development goals and the social impact and impact investment that we believe in uh, i'm a great believer that sustainability isn't just something that is about the society and it's about the economy. It's also about the sustainability of investments and, and investment opportunities. I think we have to be successful, profitable and sustainable across the board to be able to make a, a bigger difference in today's uh, world and in today's society, notwithstanding the fact that every single one of us on the call today or out there can and continue to make a difference. Thank you. Um, my next question is, let me check the time, it's 12.45, so we're gonna go to the end and soon. But the next question is, I know that you're an expert in arts and you also kind of, uh, you, you're into like um, inside the sports. Uh, question, what will happen with the arts market? Because it's kind of, it's not the, the necessary things right now in, in case like when we're at home and like we don't know what will happen in six months and what will happen in sports because for example if one year uh, sports people won't be able to properly train and gather in teams you know they're kind of lose qualifications what's your prediction what will happen 
Um, uh, they, they, as you rightly point out, Tatiana, they'll be they'll be massively hit, um, and I think uh, considering um, the less uh, you know arts force in a category of luxury, uh, so uh, people will try and put luxury on hold. Not everyone. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in, in every, um, if we look at um, the war times and if we look at the art that emerges out of the war situation, whether it's the Balkans in the 90s, whether it's the Second World War in the, in the, in the 40s, uh, I genuinely think that the art scene will boom uh, because it will enable artists to uh, now stay at home and without the pressure of having to sell create the work that actually resonates with the society. I think we're gonna see the, maybe uh, disappearance of a very, very commercial art as it was being, in a way, flogged uh, into the marketplace. So we were almost dictated what to buy and who to buy because the media uh, played a vital role in that and some super collectors did too. Uh, I remember, People like Marina Abramovic, who's originally from uh, former Yugoslavia, is one of the biggest artists of today, uh, and many other artists from that region in the 90s uh, became successful because they continued developing art during the war and after the war. I think the art scene uh, will be hit commercially, but uh, uh, in terms of the concepts, in terms of the real value for the society, I think it's going to be uh, massively, massively uh, uh, sort of beneficial to us as a society. And we might all actually come back to the importance of art for our soul. I always looked at art as the food for soul, as our cultural dividend that we must all consume, uh, regardless of the fact whether you study history of art, fine art, or I genuinely believe and always believed, and that was part of my TED talk many years ago, that uh, art is for everyone. Uh, no matter whether you're rich and poor, you must consume it. And you can consume it, whether you go to the local artist studio, whether you go to the uh, auction house, whether you go to a gallery in Mayfair or anywhere you, you might live. It's, it's, it's free of charge. Most museums in this country have been free of charge for a long, long time and have enabled people to actually benefit. Uh, the sporting industry is going to have it tougher than the artists. And the main reason for that is become a, a huge uh, commercial uh, affair out there. Uh, the sports men and women must train and that's not easy uh, being able to actually train i get up every morning at seven i do 5k run with the family actually all five of us do uh, including the the kids 11 8 and 7. Uh, we train in the evening with barry's boot camp uh, online and there's so many online training uh, platforms right now which allow you half an hour to an hour of the cardio uh, so it's very important to keep in check and in touch with the physical exercise. However, if you are a top footballer like Ronaldo Messi, uh, or if you are a top tennis player like Giocano Nadal, uh, it will be tough. However, uh, winners are winners in any, uh, in any situation. And I think this is where uh, the, the kind of sports psychology and the human psychology is gonna play a, a huge part. I think we have to look up to people who have won uh, against the odds. Uh, and for inspiration and motivation. I have, to, I have to say, I think we have to join forces with them and help them where necessary and play our own part and lead by example. We must not uh, let COVID-19 break us. We must not let uh, any virus bring us down. We must continuously find inspiration in the positivity that's out there. And there's plenty of positivity out there, not just uh, uh, negativity. And uh, we must be prepared to bounce back when the time is right. We mustn't rush because uh, if we rush, we were going to prolong the agony that many will be facing uh, for a long, long time. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing and, 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 and somewhat reading that the uh, Alliance for Anxiety and Depressions uh, are so uh, overwhelmed with the number of calls. People aren't coping really well. People are really struggling, students included, uh, of having to do the online thing and not ha being able to actually get out, uh, get for a sort of research trip, whatever they're doing. So I think we must be united in this fight uh, against something uh, that has hit us for a reason, and we must uh, come back to the basics and we must join forces to win.
And we have a question related to arts and sport and mental health from uh, Dimiana. Uh, she asked, like, studies have shown that arts and sports both aid in main mental health. Would you think that it could potentially become a trend with investments? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I um, uh, genuinely think that uh, as a mental health campaigner uh, with um, um, Mind Charity and recently we as a family have joined Anna Freud Charity, have been a great believer that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, like physical health, mental health is absolutely crucial for a well-balanced and happy life, but also happy working environment. Uh, I think we're going to be hearing more and more talks on that. Uh, the, the, the famous example is Prince Harry talking about uh, his mental health issues after the death of his mother, Princess Diana. And that's really brought out uh, it in the open. I think he's done with William and Kate more for mental health than any politician, any celebrity, any diplomat and ambassador in the world. And I think now uh, we seem to be uh, having discussions and early on in the week I was on the call uh, with uh, a great group of people from around the world, from Korea to Dubai to Moscow to uh, New York, about uh, sort of uh, importance of mental health in the times of crisis. Uh, and uh, I, I, Damiana, that, that, that's a great question. And I am I'm a great believer that this is definitely going to uh, become a trend. Uh, before this whole started, I was in talks with Dow Jones Media and the Wall Street Journal uh, about the mental health in the corporate environment. Uh, I was just saying to somebody uh, early on this morning that I'm going to reach out to these guys because uh, now more than ever, uh, the strength uh, and the character uh, is going to be incredibly important to remain confident, remain positive, embrace ourselves for the long-term whole and uh, be able to uh, emerge stronger than ever. Thank you. And we have one more question and uh, eight minutes left. So uh, the question from, actually two questions now, uh, from Victoria. Is it better to remain confidential or go public in business investment world? Um, it really depends, a good question. It really depends what uh, one wants to um, uh, disclose in terms of uh, the business uh, and world and investment opportunities. I think what we're gonna see, we're gonna see a surge of openness. I think business has been very, confidential and almost very secretive. London is a one big, one big uh, sort of secret circle uh, for many people. It's very hard to break into that circle of elites and the best opportunities in the world. And uh, I genuinely think that uh, uh, we will come out a lot more open. I think we will share opportunities uh, a lot more openly than we did before. And I genuinely, think again that's going to benefit the way in which actually we do business and coexist as a human race. Great, interesting, thank you. Um, more question from Alex. Uh, do you invest in startups and how can a new virtual startup send, send their deck to you? Um, thank you for the question, Alex. Um, uh, I um, um, initially, when we uh, put together Mayfair Investment Club, we said uh, we won't look at startups uh, arena in the seed uh, round just because the uh, ratio of success versus failure is incredibly high. And uh, the whole purpose of our club isn't just to procure investment opportunities for the members and uh, bring them to the table. Uh, it was more to actually get them to embark on the kind of educational but real life experience with investments which will uh, include investment opportunities of high growth companies that are mostly in series a b and c so we're talking about three to five million uh, all the way up to sort of 10 to 20 million investment round as opposed to looking at a startup community which is already um, massively uh, i think um, saturated with both startups, accelerators, incubators, by the same time with the investors, uh, uh, but it's uh, business angels uh, and the all early stage uh, VCs. So uh, for the time being, we will stick to our uh, uh, sort of goals and our structure that uh, uh, unless you are a, a sort of post seed startup, uh, we wouldn't be able to uh, help at this point in time, but we'll always be able to 
uh, point you in the direction of those uh, uh, investment networks that do look at startups because I, I'm a great believer that the startup community and the ecosystem built around it is the driving force of every economy. We need entrepreneurs. I think we'll uh, have more and more entrepreneurs coming out of this, uh, this situation, this crisis. I think the whole world of entrepreneurship, like I've seen in the, in the Balkans region, because of the war, people had to turn to their own devices and they had to create their own opportunities because the labor market uh, was pretty bad. And the high, when there's a high unemployment rate, when people lose jobs or the companies aren't creating enough jobs for especially young, ambitious, uh, well-educated workforce, then people have, and these, the, the youth have got to turn to themselves and do something about it. So I genuinely think this is also going to, just like with art, uh, it's going to also create some amazing uh, startup opportunities. So of course, uh, there is an exception to every rule uh, we, uh, we, 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 we do and we have, and that's also if we spot uh, what I call a rough diamond in the making. If we spot a visionary uh, startup entrepreneur who is trying to solve the world problems in the right constructive way, who might have a, a track record or may not uh, of uh, success behind him or her, then of course we would entertain that, uh, that prospect and be able to engage with them and see where that takes us. So for example, if Alex has some new virtual startup, which is kind of very relevant to nowadays, where should the Senate for you to consider, for example? And try to um, I mean, obviously uh, they can send it to the info at mayfairinvestmentclub.com. Uh, we, ha we have a team that looks at any, any of the packs. Uh, as I said, uh, I can't promise they will come back to everyone who does that. Uh, we try to make the club to be a lot more uh, sort of uh, structured in the way of us reaching out to certain people that have been recommended and referred to us uh, through our existing networks on the ground in London and internationally. But uh, we, we can't stop people to reach out to us uh, to a general uh, email and uh, engage with us. Uh, Mayfair Investment Club will not have uh, social media pages. Mayfair Investment Club uh, will not be the gathering for all just because uh, we want to create something that has the legacy. We want to create something that plays an important role uh, in today's day and age, in today's society. Uh, we want to actually uh, form the future uh, leaders of tomorrow and uh, we want to play a, a role that uh, isn't just about investment but it's about education and it's about the opportunities and it's about the foundation that will play an integral part of it. So. And we have a question from Mark uh, relating to the club. So who can join the Mayfair Investment Club and what qualifications are you looking at? I mean, it's, it's the club for 18 to 30 age group. Uh, it's not something that uh, uh, we're looking in terms of the qualifications. So we, we are going to be looking at the existing students uh, currently studying at, uh, you know, from regions to the London Business School, CAS Imperial, uh, UCL, King's, Oxford and Cambridge. But more importantly, we're looking for the right mindset. We're not looking for uh, just somebody who studied business economics, wealth management, uh, family office, you know, whatever degrees people might have done. I'm, I'm very interested in those who have done humanities, those that have done uh, uh, sort of even history of art, those who have a genuine ambition to go into the world of uh, investors, uh, really understand the ropes of it and uh, put forward uh, their own ideas, uh, what it is they want to do and why they want to uh, become investors rather than entrepreneurs. Uh, of course, uh, as any investment club, there's going to be a, a, a sort of uh, characteristics and uh, criteria, uh, not just to do with the fact that you have to commit uh, half a million to two million into the uh, hard uh, sort of financial commitment to be able to invest and build your portfolio. But more importantly, you've got to be able to uh, sort of fulfill the uh, obligations when it comes down to the longevity of your involvement with the club. We don't want to uh, club to, to sort of have people that are in and out. We just really want to attract the right mindset uh, of the people that are very much uh, in, uh, in, 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 in tune and aligned with our own ambitions and our own purpose in the world. Perfect. Thank you very much. And now it's 1 p.m. So last tip the last question which book would you recommend us to read in this situation 
we have uh, I would uh, that's a question yeah, that's something I'm not prepared to answer but the book that 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 really um jumps at me right now is the book called the good book whoa never heard about it and it's written by professor grayling who i mentioned early on in the conversation uh who i had the privilege of meeting uh, face to face it's about the book of connecting with uh the the belief system the the, the i think in the times of crisis those who believe, whether you are uh, a religious person, a spiritual person, atheist, whatever your belief system is, uh, I think uh, it's important that we rely on it because in the times of crisis, those who believe uh, in, the, in God, in higher good, in, in, in the higher spirit, uh, whatever it is, actually manage to deal with any crisis much, much better. And I think what I picked up from the book uh, of Professor Grayling is that uh, no matter what that belief system is, use this uh, as the opportunity to enhance it, use this as the opportunity to come back to the basics, use this as the opportunity of reflection, because we have lived in such a fast-paced environment, I believe, for too long. This is the first time that we have actually had to slow down, although I went to bed a couple of nights ago at 4 a.m. and I was up at 7 uh, doing a 5k run uh, I've, I've, I've never been busier out of choice rather than out of the fact that I have to do things because I'm now also self-reflecting I'm now also taking time to talk to the people that I perhaps uh, missed to talk to a year or two years ago and I'm constantly uh, self-reflecting uh, and meditating uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, environment that allows me to uh, really zone in and zone out into the things that actually matter to me and to matters of society. Great. Thank you very much. It was very, very inspiring and uh, we are good with the timing. So guys, thank you very much for joining us. We had around from 15 to 20 people pending all the time, but yeah, but thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Samir, you as always, uh, you're an amazing speaker. I told you this. Uh, so, guys, if you have any questions, you can still write it and I will pass it to Samir a bit later, okay? So, I think that's all. Have a nice day. I uh, hope for, we will be able to do 5K run as you and soon. I'm trying to do, but I do just three, uh, one for three days. But, but yeah, I'm going, going there. Uh, so, uh, do you want to say something in the end? Yes, thank, I just want to thank you for uh, really making this happen. Um, I love your work ethic and the fact that uh, you don't sit back and complain, you just make things happen. I think this is a, a great starting point and I'd love to thank uh, the entire audience uh, for all of their questions and all of the input. And I'm really looking forward to engaging with every single one of you uh, going forward. And let's hope we can use this uh, opportunity to uh, go behind the common purpose and the common ambition to make, uh, to make success uh, in whichever uh, form it comes. So wish everyone a great day and uh, speak to you very soon. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye.